Hi again, everyone. So welcome to our fifth of six sessions on who is the Buddha. And this week, we're going to be exploring the fact that the figure we call the Buddha, otherwise Siddhartha Gautama, or Shakyamuni, the sage of the Shakyas, is understood by the vast majority of Buddhists through history as not the first of his kind or the last of his kind, nor even necessarily the only figure of his kind teaching today. So we remember here that Buddha or awakened one is a title rather than a name and designates a particular kind of being who has achieved a remarkable, unfathomably knowledgeable and powerful state and who fulfills a particular function as expositor of the Dharma or Buddhist teaching in the world. We might say that for Buddhists, Shakyamuni is maybe best thought of as our Buddha, that is the Buddha of the current age, and as I'll explain in a bit more depth later, of our world, who most recently appeared here and reintroduced the Dharma after its disappearance for many, many ages. And although Buddhas are meant to be the rarest thing that one could know, they are hence not, strictly speaking, unique. Indeed, they can't be if, for example, the ultimate goal of Mahayana Buddhism is to become a Buddha oneself. This plurality of Buddhas is not just a theoretical aspect of Buddhist belief and practice. And although it's incredibly difficult, sometimes it seems impossible to tell on first sight, not every Buddha image that one would see in the world um, is a depiction of Shakyamuni. Some of these depict other named Buddhas who are also important features of Buddhist activities. Today we'll be exploring the place of the Buddha, and again that's with the definite uh, article in play, meaning Shakyamuni throughout, amongst others like him, that is predecessors, successors, and counterparts, some of whom might even be available to Buddhists directly in this life or the next. So although it's common to think of the multiplicity of Buddhas as being a feature particularly of Mahayana Buddhism, I'd like to begin with some basic points about the many Buddhas acknowledged in non-Mahayana traditions, including Theravada, the tradition that is currently prevalent in uh, Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. Because there doesn't ever seem to have been a time when Buddhists considered the Buddha to be unique. So he's always been seen as one of a type. And again, just remembering that the Buddha itself means awakened. It refers to an achievement, liberation from the cycle of rebirth and the ability to teach this to others. And according to early Buddhist traditions, there have been many Buddhas in the past and there will be more in the future, but only ever one at a time. So for the first part of today's session, we will be talking about how this idea of one Buddha at a time plays out in Buddhist literature and art. And I want to start with a story in the very distant past, as found in a Pali text from the Theravada scriptures that is called the Buddha Vangsa, or Lineage of Buddha, or Lineage of Buddhas, can't tell whether it's singular or plural in the title. And although this is a Theravada text, similar stories are told in other schools of Buddhism too. And the account is attributed to the Buddha himself, it's told in the first person, so it's presented as the Buddha talking about himself, although the text probably dates to a couple of centuries after his death. And in this portion of the text on the slide, the Buddha recounts how, in a very, very distant past life, he was born as a Brahmin named Sumedha. Having seen that life is subject to suffering and death, Sumedha wished to seek escape, and so he became an ascetic, living in a leaf hut and practicing meditation. And we're told that he was so wrapped up in his meditation that he wasn't even aware that a Buddha named Dipankara had arisen in the world. By the time he emerged from his uh, meditation, uh, Dipankara had been born, had grown up, had achieved awakening, and had begun to teach the Dharma. And some local people, expecting a visit from this great teacher, had set about clearing and prettifying the road. And so Sumedha, taking a walk after his long meditation, asked them what they were up to, and the verses on the slide tell us what happened next. So he says, asked by me, these declared that an incomparable Buddha had arisen in the world, the conqueror named Dipankara leader of the world and that it was for him that the road was being cleared. When I heard Buddha, Zest arose immediately saying, Buddha, Buddha, I expressed my happiness. Standing there, elated, stirred in mind, I reasoned, here will I sow seeds. Indeed, let not the moment pass. So even the sound of the word Buddha is the cause of great delight for Sumedha. He declares that he will sow seeds. And here, of course, we have 
another reference to the agricultural karmic metaphor we've seen multiple times in this series. So he will sow the seeds of good deeds. And because of the powerful and fertile field of merit that is a Buddha, these karmic seeds will bear spectacular fruits. So Sumedha joins in, helping to clear the road, but they're just not quite quick enough. And before they've quite finished, this great conqueror, this Buddha Dipankara, and we're told 400,000 of his liberated followers arrive. And Sumedha throws himself into the muddy road in order that the Buddha can walk on his matted hair rather than in the mud. So matted hair is a, a symbol of non-Buddhist asceticism because, of course, uh, Sumedha at this point is uh, following a non-Buddhist ascetic path. And so this is the image you can see here on the slide. It's a very famous scene and uh, here a final fine example of Gandharan art, that is to say from the very far northwest of the Indian subcontinent, present day Pakistan. And Gandhara was a really important Buddhist region in the early centuries of the common era and it's where a lot of our earliest Buddhist art and indeed uh, textual evidence comes from. The story of Dipankara seems to have been particularly popular here. And this scene is the crucial moment in the story, as we will see. So, the Brahmin ascetic Sumedha is lying in the mud at the feet of a past Buddha named Dupankara, and the story in the Buddha Vansa continues. While I was lying on the earth, it was thus in my mind, if I so wished, I could burn up my defilements today. But what is the use, while I remain unknown, of realising Dharma here? Having reached omniscience, I will become a Buddha in the world with the Devas. What is the use of my crossing over alone, being a man aware of my strength? Having reached omniscience, I will cause the world, together with the devas, to cross over. By this act of merit of mine towards the supreme among men, I will reach omniscience. I will cause many people to cross over. Now this passage is rather famous because it contains the idea that the man Sumedha could have become liberated, achieving nirvana through becoming an arhat, a liberated disciple of the Buddha Dipankara, at this point in time. But crucially, he decided not to. Instead, he decided to become a Buddha, a far more difficult form of liberated being, but one of greater benefit to the world. And having achieved Buddhahood, he would be able to help the world, together with the devas, cross over. Now, the devas are the gods, a reminder that even deities can benefit from the teachings of a Buddha, since they are still trapped in the cycle of rebirth and redeath. And crossing over, as we've seen before, is a common metaphor for the achievement of nirvana or liberation. The ocean is Sangsara, the churning up of death and rebirth, and the further shore is Nirvana. By becoming a Buddha, he will not only achieve Nirvana himself, but he will help countless others achieve the same. And this requires great resolve and great compassion. And Dipankara Buddha, already liberated and all-knowing, then declares to the surrounding people, Do you see this very severe ascetic, this matted hair ascetic? Innumerable eons from now, he will be a Buddha in the world. And Dipankara then goes on to specify lots of details about Sumedha's life, future life as a Buddha, that would be familiar to any Buddhist, like the name of his parents, the city of his birth, the location in which he will achieve awakening, the name of the two men who will become his chief disciples. So there's absolutely no doubt here for audiences of this text. Dipankara identifies this man, Sumedha, as the Buddha that we know, our Buddha, the Buddha Gautama, as he tends to be called in Pali texts. And this encounter is usually referred to as Dipankara's prediction, of Sumedha's future Buddhahood. But we might ask ourselves, is this a case of Dipankara seeing the future or of guessing it right best based on his witnessing of current conditions? Or does Dipankara's statement in fact make it happen? And what is the role of Sumedha's own aspiration or vow in this whole process? An extensive Buddhist traditions grew out of this encounter, exploring the need for vows and predictions on the path to Buddhahood more generally. As Sumedha himself in the text reflects, the utterance of Buddhas is not of double meaning. The utterance of conquerors is not false. There is no untruth in Buddhas. Assuredly, I will be a Buddha. So it is bound to happen. And of course, uh, we know as the audience of the text that it did happen because this text is set in the very, very dim and distant past. But crucially, there's still a long way to go from this point. So next in the text, Sumedha considers what he needs to do in order to become a Buddha in a distant future life. He looks carefully at the various qualities, usually referred to as perfections, that are required for Buddhahood, such as great generosity, enormous resolve, and complete wisdom. And he knows that this is a long-term path, requiring many, many lifetimes. 
and indeed the many lifetimes between his time as Sumedha and his final births, when he actually finally becomes a Buddha, are the subject of a huge body of stories popular within Buddhist traditions. These stories are Jataka stories, or birth stories that recount episodes in the Buddha's past lives. While he encounters past Buddhas very occasionally, the majority of his past life stories actually involve him living in times of no Buddhism, and the most popular stories recount, in particular, the great lengths he went to in order to perfect his generosity, ready for his own achievement of Buddhahood. So the story of Sumedha's encounter with the past Buddha Dipankara is the most development, developed past Buddha encounter that we have in the literature, and it's worth pointing out that there are different stories, different versions of the story in circulation. But this isn't the only encounter by any means. The Buddha Vangsa itself carries on describing, albeit much more briefly, the encounter with subsequent past Buddhas, a list of 24 in total. According to this tradition, the Bodhisattva, as he's referred to, the being destined for Buddhahood, renews his vow at each of their feet and receives another prediction from each of the past Buddhas. So remembering that the title of the text, Buddha Vangsa, means Buddha lineage. So this repeated vow and prediction format certainly shows how our Buddha takes his place within the lineage. Not many of the other past Buddhas mentioned in the Buddha Vangsa are discussed in the tradition. But once we get closer to the time of our own Buddha, we find a fairly well-known list of the, the most recent six Buddhas, beginning with one called Vipassi Buddha. Now these six are also known from another Pali scripture that is earlier even than the Buddha Vangsa. And this is a, a, a sutta called the Mahabhadana Sutta, and it's found in the Diga Nikaya, the long discourses of the Buddha. I've put a note in the PowerPoint file to a, a full translation uh, of this text in case you're interested, so a reminder that you can download this PowerPoint file later on and use the images and other resources that we've provided both in the slides and also in the notes part of the file. So the text of the Mahabhadana Sutta in the Diga Nikaya presents the Buddha, that is to say our Buddha, uh, telling his monks the life story of the past Buddha, Vipassi, or Vipassian in Sanskrit, before also listing the other more recent Buddhas, giving a few details about each. So Vipassi's life story is strikingly similar to the story we associate with our Buddha, Gautama or Shakyamuni. In other words, this is another example of the parallelism between the different Buddhas. The Buddha is a type, and with some variations in detail, the model life story is broadly the same for them all. There is a Buddha blueprint. And indeed, this life story of Vipassi Buddha is the earliest Buddha life story we have, earlier, in fact, than the life stories of the Buddha of our time. One of the details that differs in the life stories of different Buddhas is the type of tree under which each Buddha achieves awakening. And this detail informs our understanding of a tradition of depicting these different trees as representative of the different Buddhas. So recall, as we discussed last time, that uh, especially before we see the Buddha depicted in human form, that the tree of awakening is a popular way of referring to a Buddha. And this image here at the bottom of the slide is uh, an early depiction of multiple Buddhas, each depicted as a stupa or reliquary mound and a tree. And this depiction is itself on a railing, on a gateway to a major stupa, the Sanchi stupa, which is one of the earliest Buddhist sites that we have, uh, dating to a little before the beginning of the common era. And the six Buddhas are depicted at Sanchi, beginning with Vipassi, and then the latest Buddha, Gautama, as the seventh. So we've seen that the Buddha of our time is part of a list of either 24, since his initial vow at the feet of Dipankara Buddha, or seven, belonging to the current eon, which is simply a very long unit of time. But in fact, the lists get longer and longer. So Dipankara wasn't the first Buddha, although many traditions suggest that he was the first to have a really potent encounter with the person who would become the Buddha of our time. But the Buddhas of the past go back and back. They are without number, and hence we get depictions such as the others on the slide. The top left image is from northeast India, the site of an ancient Buddhist university called Nalanda. The middle top image is of the interior of a spectacular cave, Dambulla, um, a Buddhist cave complex in Sri Lanka. So a completely different artistic tradition, but you can see the same agendas at play. And if you download the PowerPoint file later, you can look at a larger version of the image and really appreciate the ceiling in particular, which is covered in row upon row of painted Buddhas. And why is it important to Buddhists to depict the Buddha as one amongst many, or to tell stories of his past life encounters with Buddhas of the past, or indeed of the lives of past Buddhas themselves? So 
First of all, encounters with past Buddhas, especially those that involve a vow and prediction, lend authority to the current Buddha by showing his achievement acknowledged by lineage of great teachers. And this lineage also underlines an important point about the Dharma. This truth with a capital T is not something created by the Buddha or indeed revealed to him. Rather, it is the truth underlying the world and it is realized in turn by each and every Buddha. So placing our Buddha in a lineage reinforces the authority of the Dharma, the same Dharma as taught by every past Buddha, but each time eventually forgotten by his followers. Some scholars have pointed out also that placing the Buddha in this type of lineage may be a deliberate refutation of the idea that he had any teachers in his final lifetime. So his realization is his own, but it is the same as those the uh, past teachers. But there is another really important reason for celebrating the idea that Gautama Buddha is not unique, and that's the way we see the future. For Buddhas don't exist only in the past, by implication there are also future Buddhas in the making, maybe even all around us right now. And so here you can see another important way of depicting the seven Buddhas of the current eon, starting with Vipassi and ending with Gautama. But there is another figure, an eighth figure, who looks a little bit different to the rest. And that's because he's not yet a Buddha. He is only a Bodhisattva, a being destined for Buddha, Buddhahood. This, in fact, is Maitreya in Sanskrit, or Mikaya, as he's known in Pali, and he is understood to be the next Buddha. He's currently biding his time in a heaven realm, waiting for the right moment to descend into a human womb and begin the Buddha life story all over again. And this right moment will be in the distant future, after the current monastic traditions and teachings have all been lost. So Buddhism has to die out before it can be renewed. And one of the reasons that Maitreya is important is that he offers a promise of future opportunities to access the teachings of a Buddha fresh. So many Buddhist practices, including in the Theravada tradition, revolve around the desire to be reborn in his proximity, to encounter him and to hear the teachings directly from him. This, it is believed, will make liberation far more possible than it is today. In this role as the coming Buddha, Maitreya is depicted as a prince sometimes or as a god, or, here in the slide, and peculiar to East Asian Buddhism, as a jolly fat Buddha-like figure, a promise of future happiness. He is not a Buddha quite yet, but he offers something that in many ways is more precious, the promise of future opportunities. So to summarise, we have from the beginning and across Buddhist traditions a clear understanding that the Buddha was incredibly special, but not unique. Rather, his achievements, and even details of his life story, mirror those of past Buddhas forming lists of varying numbers, but implicitly countless. The long list of past Buddhas extends into the future too, with another Buddha, Maitreya, promised before the end of the eon, and many more after that. In non-Mahayana traditions, including the Theravada tradition still prevalent in Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia today, these many Buddhas are strictly one at a time. But, as Chris will now explore, this rule ends up with a little different perspective in Mahayana traditions. So, Okay, we have past Buddhas, stretching back, it would seem, into the beginningless past, and we have future Buddhas, of whom the only one that might practically matter, or at least one that really matters, is Maitreya, seeing as, as he would be next, and it would be the sensible goal of many Buddhists to aim for a good rebirth during Maitreya's time uh, teaching in the world as a fully awakened being. However, remember that in Mahayana Buddhism, which developed 2000 years ago, roughly in India, and today is still prevalent across Central and East Asia and also in the West. Here, the ultimate goal is not to learn under a Buddha to simply become liberated, but to in the end become a Buddha oneself, so that one might do the liberating teaching of a Buddha in the distant future. Mahayana Buddhism is incredibly diverse in its ideas and its practices, but at its core is this aspiration to be a bodhisattva oneself, and so to ultimately fill the role that Gautama or Shakyamuni played in the world for the sake of other beings who would continue to suffer through transmigration. But as Naomi has already said, we have this rule in Buddhism that there can only be one Buddha in the world at a time. What we mean by the world is a complex business in Buddhism, and there is maybe just a simplified account uh, that we could go into. Now, we've tried to stress that transmigration or samsara is not, strictly speaking, the world. It's the process 
through which we are all going, which Buddhism seeks to end. On the left of the current slide is one pre-modern depiction of our world according to Buddhist cosmography. That is, according to attempt to map what is believed to be around us. I'm not going into further detail here, but I include in the slides uh, uh, a note that talks a little bit about this picture of the world that develops uh, in Indian Buddhism and then is transmitted across uh, Asia. But this geography or cosmography um, isn't quite so central to Buddhist thought as the idea of the world as a range of possible kinds of rebirth. And into this world, that is the totality of kinds of beings that there are, at great intervals, there might emerge a Buddha. And we've touched on this already in earlier sessions. On the right in the slide is a diagram of how one might end up in any given lifetime, dictated by one's past actions, that is karma. So one could be a human, and this is very rare and very precious. One could be a deity, that's also of course rare, and of course remember temporary, as far as Buddhism is concerned. One could be an animal, and supposedly we're animals most of the time, or worse, that is, as a hungry ghost or residing in a hell realm, these being the results of particularly bad deeds. These are not infrequent at all. And into what we might call the realm of humans in all this, every so often, there emerges a Buddha. And hopefully, by now in this series, this broad model is, is clear enough. Now, for Mahayana Buddhism, in which the aim is to eventually become one of these Buddhas, there is then something of a problem. This whole process is meant to take an incalculably long time for Shakyamuni and then for Maitreya after him. Um, and this is because, on the one hand, this is an absurdly difficult task to eventually attain complete awakening. But add also to this the fact that if many followers of Mahayana Buddhism are seeking this end, then one would have to wait one's turn as well for potentially aeons upon aeons at a time because of this grand cycle of the Dharma being introduced, then fading, being forgotten, and so forth. And because by necessity there could only be one Buddha in the world at a time, with long gaps between them also, becoming a Buddha takes still longer than one would ever want. So what might be one's solution to this in Mahayana Buddhist thought? Well, one very novel idea that develops in India, again, we think roughly 2000 years ago, is that if there can be only one Buddha in the world, but also so many beings striving to be Buddhas, perhaps there are in fact multiple worlds. And this current slide tries to depict this. Admittedly, Mahayana Buddhist texts talk about these worlds or world systems as if they were all somehow on the same plane. So, a different world might be said to be very, very, very far away in the north or something like this. But they are essentially the same but different to our world system. These parallel worlds are also understood to be countless in number. Now, I wouldn't labor this point too much, but I sometimes say to students, they could think of this as something close to the idea in modern science fiction of different parallel dimensions. Seeing as what we have here is something like a different axis that's introduced to the direction of rebirth, as I hope this slide communicates. But what roles do these other worlds play? Well, if there are other worlds in this fashion, like our own but different, then there are other regions, so other opportunities for bodhisattvas to become Buddhas. One need not strive in just this world, waiting one's turn, but one could at least in theory become fully awakened and reintroduce the Dharma in another world system, where the Dharma has already been lost long ago. Mahayana texts seldom, if ever, talk about this as being a quick process, but it is in the grand scheme of things, something of a reassurance. I may sooner become the fully awakened liberator of another world rather than having to wait longer here. But there is um, another very important role that these other worlds or this idea of other worlds can play. If there are, so many of these other worlds or world systems out there, then some of them must also be home to Buddhas still currently teaching right now. Remember from the last session that an early, then arguably perennial concern in Buddhism is the apparent absence of the Buddha. He may be present through his relics, images, or the Dharma itself, but I'm obviously not in the company of a living teaching Buddha, learning from him directly. 
But if there are other Buddhas in other worlds and I can attain rebirth there, I can surely make far faster progress in the direction of becoming a Buddha myself in some other further world again. Such is how Mahayana Buddhism opens up the range of how one might take rebirth. And this isn't just a supplementary feature of Mahayana Buddhist thought. A crucial aspect of the tradition, diverse as it is, is this recognition of what are called multiple Buddha fields, or in Sanskrit, Buddha Kshetras. The Buddha field is the sphere of activity of a given Buddha, or if you like, it is the domain of a Buddha. And we, of course, are in the pedagogical domain of Shakyamuni Buddha, albeit after his passing, which will eventually then be the Buddha field of Maitreya. The supposed existence and character of other Buddha fields is a feature of some very important Mahayana texts from India. And these are the foundation for some of the most popular forms of East Asian Buddhism today. And I'm now talking about what is called Pure Land Buddhism, which dominates in especially Japan and to a slightly lesser extent in China and Korea. And this developed in East Asia in the late first millennium and has at its center Buddhist texts concerned with one particularly important Buddha field other to our own. The foundation for this tradition are versions of what is called the Sukhavati Vyuha Sutra. This is a Mahayanist sutra, so a discourse attributed to the Buddha, that we think is produced perhaps in the very early centuries of the common era. And here the Buddha, that is our Buddha, Shakyamuni, describes to his audience the features of a distant world called Sukhavati, that's sometimes translated as the land of bliss. Unlike our world, which is characterized by humans having short lifespans, harsh geography and natural and man-made disasters, Sukhavati is a positive paradise. It has been made pure, indeed into a pure land, by the power of a Buddha who resides there and is teaching still right now. This Buddha is called Amitabha, meaning measureless light, or sometimes called Amitayus, measureless life. All Buddhas are meant to have the same appearance and qualities, so he should really be indistinguishable from Shakyamuni. But for complex reasons, Amitabha or Amitayus is supposed to live far longer, far, far longer than our Buddha. He's been teaching in Sukhavati for aeons and will keep doing so for longer still. And here in the slide uh, are a couple of passages uh, from the opening of this text, the Sukhavati Vyuha. So it opens at one time, the Blessed One, uh, the Buddha Shakyamuni was staying near the city of Shravasti in the cloistered garden that the generous Anatta Pindata gave to the Buddhist order in Prince Jetta's Grove. Now you don't need to worry about these details, but it's worth including because this is a standard opening to all kinds of uh, Buddhist discourses, whether they're Mahayanist or non-Mahayanist. This is our Buddha Shakyamuni in a familiar place to the audience speaking uh, about a new topic. But then he goes on to talk to one of his uh, most revered disciples, Shariputra, and talks about this other Buddha. The Blessed One, Shakyamuni, addressed the revered uh, Reverend Shariputra, saying, to the west of us, Shariputra, a hundred thousand million Buddha fields from where we are, there is a world called the Land of Bliss, Sukhavati. At this very moment, the Tathagata Arhat, perfect and full Buddha called Amitayus, or Amitabha, lives in that Buddha field. He abides and remains there, and even now continues to teach the Dharma in that field. I add again that this is Mahayana Buddhist material, so it's not at all recognized by the Theravada tradition. But here we find our Buddha, Shakyamuni, teaching about another Buddha, who even after Shakyamuni has passed, will be available to Buddhists in their next lives. Forms of Pure Land Buddhism in East Asia revere Shakyamuni as much as any other Buddhists. But they also venerate Amitabha as a self, uh, salvific figure who can play a part in improving our lives now and in the next life. And this slide is another passage from the Sukhavati Vyuha, and to vary things I'm now translating from a surviving Chinese version of the text. If a good man or woman who hears of Amitabha holds fast to his name, even for a day, or two, three, four, five, six, or seven days, with a concentrated and undistracted mind, then at the hour of death, Amitabha will appear with his coast. The aspirant will be born immediately in Sukhavati, the domain of Amitabha. Forms of Pure Land Buddhism are sometimes pretty bleak about the state of our world and us in it in the current age. 
They stress that our world after Shakyamuni's apparent departure is particularly desperate and the Dharma is all but forgotten. We ourselves are a rotten lot. We're bogged down in vice and wickedness and we stand little chance of making any progress towards liberation by ourselves as long as we remain here. By comparison, the world of Sukhavati provides ideal conditions for progressing towards liberation and in the meantime is pretty pleasant also. Amitabha, phenomenally compassionate as he is, strives to bring, uh, bring all sentient beings into his company in their next life, if they so much as remember or chant his name. And this is why chanting, what in Japanese is called the Nembutsu, literally the idea of the Buddha, is a widespread practice in forms of Pure Land Buddhism. Chanting Namu Amida Butsu, that is homage to Amitabha Buddha, is an expression of the devotee calling to mind Amitabha, as we see here in the passage on the slide. Different forms of Pure Land Buddhism understand differently how this has an effect. For some, this repeated act of remembering or chanting Amitabha's name because of compassionate vows made by him leads one to be reborn in his world, in his company. For other denominations, though, we are understood to be so uh, powerless ourselves that it is Amitabha's power itself that stirs us even to make any kind of commitment to him. In other words, it's him doing the work through and through. And in East Asia, there's this interesting dichotomy that develops between the notion of one's own power as a liberating force, which arguably is a focus in the rest of the Buddhist world, and the other power of Amitabha, which cannot liberate us completely, but can draw us out of our current sorry state and into his company. Now, all of this is complicated enough, perhaps confusing enough. And of course, we can discuss any of these Mahayanist buddhological developments further in the time after this session. But I think it worth trying to uh, briefly talk about a very different Mahayanist Buddhist context again, in which Shakyamuni shares the stage with other Buddhas who are not of the past or future, and perhaps not also best thought of as of the present, but other Buddhas that could be considered in a sense atemporal. And this involves me introducing the no less slippery concept of Tantra or Tantric religion. And this isn't an easy uh, or quick thing to unpack. And I think it's sometimes confused by a lot of literature that tries its very best to explain what's going on here. Tantra is a Sanskrit word that originally refers to literature. So it's a bit like the word sutra. But in this case, um, it refers to things that we associate with the latter half of the first millennium CE. In other words, things tantric in Buddhism, texts and the things described by these texts date to well over a thousand years after we would normally date the historical Buddha. What can be called tantric Buddhism goes by many names and can be found today still in Tibet, Nepal, Japan, and as of the last few generations, of course, outside of Asia also. Tantric Buddhism is sometimes also called Vajrayana Buddhism. Vajrayana means the diamond vehicle. And the sense here is that it's a mode of Buddhist teaching and practice that's both superlatively valuable, but also incredibly potent. Diamond being a particularly hard, maybe indestructible substance. But I want to push back against the common idea that this is a third kind of Buddhism in the world after Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism. And this because every Vajrayana practitioner has in mind the goal of becoming fully awakened. That is the goal of ultimately becoming a Buddha, as is of course the case with the rest of the Mahayana Buddhist world. The difference here between other forms of Mahayana and what gets called Vajrayana is not one of goal, but it's a difference in method. Tantric religion is characterized in very simple terms by the use of esoteric rituals. These are sometimes internalized as meditative exercise, as, uh, sorry, meditative exercises, but not always. And these are done to realize power either in the world or to make swift progress in the direction of liberation from it. These rituals would generally involve evoking a deity or some other incredibly powerful being with whom the practitioner then becomes identified. And this empowers the practitioner, at least for a short time, and in the eyes of the tradition, it brings them closer to achieving the status of that deity or whatever else in a more lasting fashion. An important device that's used in tantric rituals is the mandala. And mandala means quite simply a circle. But tantric ritual mandalas 
are often quite complex diagrammatical structures. And these are meant to represent an arrangement of teachings, deities, and Buddhas, and their relations to one another. And they normally have a particularly important figure located at the center. These mandalas are portrayed in tantric Buddhist art, and they can be constructed for ritual purposes. But they are also primarily constructed in one's mind during these elaborative, ritualized meditative practices. And they are then, uh, these practices are meant to culminate with some encounter with the central divinity, and then an identification with that figure. In the slide, we see just one very important mandala, what's called the Vajradhatu mandala, or diamond realm mandala. And it has at its center, I apologize, it's a bit of a fuzzy image here, five Buddhas that are of different colors. Now, unusually for Buddhist art, these Buddhas are in tantric tradition often depicted in regal dress. And this is because they're not the kind of Buddhas one would meet walking around in the world. Instead, these are Buddhas in magisterial heavenly guise. And this is a clue that we're not dealing with physical entities that one might ever meet in the world as we know it. In the center of these five Buddhas, each of which again is a different color, is a Buddha with vibrant white skin. And this is the Buddha Vairochana, meaning the radiant one. Vairochana has an older history in Indian Buddhism, but he is in a sense, Shakyamuni. He is Shakyamuni in his true nature, that is not simply as a teacher who came into the world and left it, but rather who can manifest innumerable forms in innumerable places in order to help sentient beings. Vairochana and these other Buddhas in the mandala are both symbolic, but also as the tradition, uh, tradition understands it, something more than just symbols. Remember from last week, the sense in Buddhism that a Buddha's physical person is not necessarily his real person. These Buddhas are entities that can be known through ritualized meditative encounter. And they are at least as real, if not more real, than any Buddha one could possibly meet in the flesh. It's also not only these abstract atemporal Buddhas that one could meet in tantric meditation. And so to finish off, I want to touch on some of the other very important objects of Buddhist devotion across Asia, who are not Buddhas, though essentially could be considered Buddhas in all but name. We've discussed already how Buddhists in the world, uh, the world over acknowledge the existence of deities, and they're quite happy to venerate them, knowing that these gods themselves are also stuck in the cycle of rebirth, just in a privileged position. But there is this other category, that is the bodhisattva, and specifically what are sometimes called in literature celestial bodhisattvas, but what I often call more simply advanced bodhisattvas. And we know one of these figures already, this is Maitreya, who of course is not yet a Buddha, as Naomi has described. And yet Buddhists of many traditions venerate Maitreya as the bodhisattva who will next reintroduce the Dharma to the world in the future. But across the Mahayana Buddhist world, there's a whole pantheon of advanced bodhisattvas whom one can find in literature, in art, in ritual traditions, and uh, that one could in theory meet directly, maybe in another Buddha field, or in the strange secretive encounters of tantric meditation. We remember that for any Mahayana Buddhist, the ideal is to be a bodhisattva, and so at some stage, a Buddha oneself. But Mahayana Buddhism recognizes many different, very powerful, very compassionate bodhisattvas who are already like Maitreya, close to becoming fully awakened already. In fact, at the very highest echelons of their practice, these bodhisattvas are greater than any god, and they have basically the same knowledge and power as Buddhas, but they dwell beyond the everyday world and they are waiting far from passively to take form as Buddhas in one world or another and to complete their journey. In Mahayana Buddhist cultures, the Buddha shares the stage with some of these advanced bodhisattvas and perhaps most notable is Avalokiteshvara. That's admittedly quite a mouthful. His name means something like the Lord Ishvara who observes Avalokita. And what Avalokiteshvara observes is the suffering and struggling of sentient beings. Avalokiteshvara is often called the bodhisattva of compassion. This can be a bit misleading. All bodhisattvas are meant to be compassionate after all, but he's a figure commonly defined by his limitless concern for others. And in this slide are four depictions of this same figure, but admittedly not all of the same type. 
So we have here on the left, perhaps a, a third century North Indian stone image. This is a relatively early depiction of Avalokiteshvara, and it doesn't look too different to some of the other classical art that we've seen. Next, we have a depiction of the thousand-armed, eleven-headed Avalokiteshvara, and the many limbs and faces are indicative of his involvement in our world and other worlds in the lives of a great many lesser beings. And then we have an East Asian depiction of Avalokiteshvara. And as hopefully you can tell here, he is instead a she. The Chinese figure Guan Yin, or in Japanese Kanon, is called sometimes the goddess of mercy, but she is a form of Avalokiteshvara, that's how she's understood, and is a ubiquitous feature of especially Japanese popular religion. And finally, a bit different to these, is the easily recognizable face of the 14th and current Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lamas are a lineage of Tibetan teachers who, for traditional Tibetan Buddhists, are understood to be something a little different to the rest of us. They are emanations by Avalokiteshvara, or instruments projected into our world by him in order to protect the Dharma and guide the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. Now, undoubtedly, the current Dalai Lama says different things about his status for different audiences, given that he does have a truly global audience now. But at least traditionally, he's meant to be a living testament uh, to Avalokiteshvara's activity in our world. So the final point that I'm making is that the further we dive into especially Mahayana Buddhism and the more cultural contexts we study, the more we find the category of what is a Buddha becomes somewhat fuzzy. Strictly speaking, these bodhisattvas like Avalokiteshvara are not Buddhas, but this only because they have not yet fulfilled that pivotal role in the world as revealers and expositors of the Dharma. In the meantime, they are no less important. Sometimes it seems even more so as figures who can protect followers of the Mahayana as they aim to make slow progress as bodhisattvas themselves or simply just make it through the trials and tribulations of samsara. So we've covered quite a lot of ground today, and, but really we're just trying to make one central point, which is that although all Buddhist traditions put the Buddha Shakyamuni or Siddhartha Gautama in a pivotal position, he is seldom, if ever, thought of as unique. Some modern Buddhists may well be very focused on the Buddha as a historical figure, who was indeed one of a kind, but it seems that Asian Buddhist traditions have universally thought him to be one of many. In early Buddhism, and today in Theravada Buddhism, he is only the most recent awakened being to come to the world, continuing a lineage of previous Buddhas. And this lineage extends into the future too, with the next Buddha Maitreya and others after that. In Mahayana Buddhism, we find Buddhas not only in the past and future, but in the present, occupying far distant worlds that are parallel to our own. And there are also Buddhas of tantric meditative practice, who, although not tangible, can be encountered face to face in one's own mind. And it's also worth remembering that for Mahayana Buddhism, in which the line between advanced Bodhisattva and Buddha is incredibly thin, we find Buddhists very invested in the worship of Bodhisattvas alongside Shakyamuni and indeed other Buddhas. So in short, the, the occasional focus of some literature about Buddhism on the Buddha, as if he is the beginning and end of Buddhist teaching, can be misleading. For many Buddhists, he is supremely important, but also one among many many more of whom, in the endlessness of time, are yet to be realised. <laughs>